Those who love him, who call him Bubba, Papa, Les, who knew the richness of his white oak heart before life's rings were laid, can tell that this last picture is a saw. And they know why. Lester Potts came to painting late in life. Born in Alabama's Pickens County, west of Tuscaloosa, he was reared during the Great Depression. He grew up laboring in the family sawmill and served in the Army during the Korean conflict. He learned an iron work ethic and a suspicion of all idle endeavors. But in his mid-70s, Lester Potts fell under the grip of Alzheimer's, a disease that clouded his mind and robbed him of his strength. Eventually, his family could meet his needs no longer, and he entered an adult daycare facility. And then, in the words of his son, a miracle occurred. A volunteer taught Lester Potts to paint watercolors, and suddenly a part of him that had been missing for a long time resurfaced. His son, Daniel Potts, was astounded. A neurologist based in Tuscaloosa, Daniel was struggling himself. He felt he should have noticed his father's symptoms earlier, but when he saw these canvases and the change that came over his father, Daniel was moved to creations of his own. In only a few weeks, he composed dozens of poems, meditating on his father's life and art. These poems, and many of Lester's paintings, have been collected in a book called The Broken Jar. The only paintbrush he had held to that point was one which whitewashed fences, painted barns, or trimmed siding at a house, Daniel Potts writes in the book's introduction. What subsequently happened could be compared to wildflowers blossoming from a fallen log in the Pickens County woods. Beautiful florals, inviting still lives, breathtaking landscapes, heartwarming Christmas scenes came home with him to the amazement of the family. And more poignantly, a broken man was given, once again, something for which to be proud. Dr. Andrew Duxbury, a UAB geriatrician, says art has the power to transform patients with Alzheimer's disease. Art is one of the most basic kind of impulses that uh, human beings have. There is an absolute need to create. As soon as children learn to pick up crayons, they are driven to draw pictures, Duxbury says. It is a way they can express what is going on in their minds when they don't have the language skills to express themselves verbally. And the same thing is true for Alzheimer's patients. They need to get their thoughts and feelings out in some way. And art is a perfect vehicle. The process of creating uh, involves a lot of different parts of the brain. And some of it is memory involved and some of it is emotionally involved. And uh, in a brain that is starting to have damage from Alzheimer's disease or uh, another related dementia, the artistic impulse is not usually damaged in that way. But the pitiless march of Alzheimer's does not bypass the artistic sense forever. Over time, the disease begins to influence everything from choice of subjects to color palettes. This becomes especially obvious when you can compare the early and late works of artists who have struggled with Alzheimer's. The Dutch abstract expressionist Willem de Kooning, for example, painted dark, intricate canvases early in his career. Later, his style became simpler, his colors much more bold. As the disease progresses, however, it eventually obliterates everything in its path. One of the most striking examples of this degeneration comes from a much more obscure artist by the name of Carolus Horn. Carolus Horn was a Swiss uh, magazine illustrator and he took annual vacations to Venice where he used to sketch and one of his favorite subjects for sketching was the Rialto Bridge in Venice and so we just happened to have many different views that he did over the years of that particular subject. Horn's family had a history of Alzheimer's and he developed the disease relatively early in life starting when he was in his late 50s. Horn continued to travel with his family on its annual trips to Venice, and he continued to sketch the Rialto Bridge. But the changes in his artistic style were unmistakable. If you look at Alzheimer's art in general, these are very usual things that one sees. There tends to be a uh, choosing of very bright primary colors over more soft pastel or shades. There is a loss of three dimensions in drawing for a flatter two dimensions. There is a more simplistic rendering of the world. Detail goes away. 
In the very late stages of the disease, Duxbury says, patients are usually no longer capable of communicating verbally, and the only way they can express themselves is in terms of shapes or smears. A single color, such as horns red, dominates. The same pattern repeated itself in the paintings of Lester Potts, but it eventually brought out heartbreaking new layers of meaning. Much like human life, the early works were simplistic and primitive, Daniel Potts writes. The middle, more refined. And the latest paintings, strangely rudimentary, yet intriguing. The last of all is also the plainest, but speaks most truly of the man. In his book's final poem, The Crosscut Saw, Daniel Potts attempts to decode this final, poignant message left behind as his father slipped away. He spoke of it to me whenever two were needed for a task, and tales of pushing, pulling, giving, taking teamwork between man and boy goaded little hands to help him. Strength, innate to him, was given meaning and a name across its blade, whereas a son he'd first sensed power and endurance in his father's arms. He wore me out on that old saw, was often said submissively. Like most sons, he felt himself a lesser man than dad. Through murky mists he strains expectantly to see his father's face, no longer there, and feel the tug of steely arms which first embodied might. When looking on the crosscut saw, one notices a missing end. Perhaps his eyes misjudged and drew onto another page, a scrap discarded like a stubby hardwood log yet of itself an artful work of hand. In deepest spaces of the soul I know this theory won't suffice, for amidst fragments of a broken mind, longings of a wandering heart, in comforts of a loving God, the undone portion takes its shape. A handle clasped by nail-scarred palms, familiar, strong, and true, which can't be painted, only felt, in pushing, pulling, giving, taking teamwork between friends. So the saw remains, its image speaking for the one whose severed sentences stack up like stumpy syllables upon a sawdust bed. The sum of what it says is this. Strength, labor, trust, family, love, and home.